Welcome, everyone. This is Taboo 2. I've been sitting on this topic for a couple of years, worried about the repercussions of going public with the concept, but the idea keeps scratching at me, and since I'm not trying to win any popularity contest here, and my channel is called Taboo for a reason, I decided to go ahead and present the idea, which I hope leads to further discussion because I actually believe this is important. Let me begin by saying that this issue has nothing to do with me. I'm happily married to a person who is not my cousin, and we've been married for 19 years. I never knew my cousins for most of my life, and they're all like 20 years older than me, and so you can dispense with those knee-jerk personal attacks as this isn't some sort of hidden desire of mine. But I do believe that we've been tricked over the last 200 years into believing a falsehood that has allowed powerful families to maintain control over you as they care about their bloodlines. In contrast, you probably have no interest in your bloodline, and your lack of interest was designed that way. But many of you are probably laughing to yourself, thinking of all of the inbred and deformed royals who somehow didn't get the memo that they weren't supposed to marry their cousins. But I ask you, what if that memo was instead written by those royal families, and they laugh at you for your unquestioning gullibility. Here's a th hypothetical for you. Suppose marriage between cousins was encouraged in today's society, and there was no alleged health reason to not marry your cousin. With this hypothetical environment in mind, let's suppose you married your first or second cousin. Your parents were cousins, and their parents were cousins, and so forth. Ask yourself this question, what would your family be like now? Would you have a closer bond to your family? Would you have a closer bond to your spouse? Would your children have a stronger bond with their family? Would you despise your in-laws as many of us do? Or would you have an impenetrable fam familial bond? Do you think it would have an impact on maintaining wealth in your family and long-term objectives? What about geographic proximity? Would you do the unthinkable and even group together in a community and create a lasting estate for the family? What about unique familial traditions? Would you still have them? What about your relationship with others outside your family? Would you be less interested in non-family relationships? And for those Game of Thrones fans, would you be more like the Lannister family, without the evil side, and even have your own family crest that you honored and cherished? and could care less about other government-imposed identities? Would family be vastly more important to you than your national, state, or city identity? What if you then somehow convinced everyone else to dilute their bloodlines by marrying whomever, but you kept your secret family institution going, knowing the benefits? Would your family become more powerful while others become less so? Now, I hope the honest truth seeker is starting to see why I'm making this video. The que now, this question may seem irrelevant, but how many people in society, when they think of colloidal silver ingestion, think of blue-skinned people like this? Do you think that it's a mere coincidence that many think of that blue man when they think of colloidal silver ingestion? Look at this article. I agree 100% with this article. The blue man theme was created by the pharmaceutical industry to scare you from using a very effective natural remedy that's an amazing cure for many ailments. But because of indoctrination in the media, the evil cabal was able to take a single or handful of cases out of millions of users to create a false illusion that everyone who ingests colloidal silver is going to turn blue. Hundreds of thousands of people die each year from pharmaceutical drugs, but no one thinks of the, that fact when they swallow pills from the pharmacy. It's fascinating how easy it is to manipulate humanity. As another example, let's say one child in America dies from polio, who didn't receive the vaccination because his parents don't believe in vaccinations. You'd see repeated news stories scaring you about anti-vaxxers, However, you'll not see a single news story covering the tens of thousands of children who die shortly after being vaccinated every year. 
I think most of my viewers understand this form of manipulation. So, if some royal in a hundred years has a hereditary deformity, that deformity or handful of deformities could be cited ad nauseum by the media to the point that everyone's convinced that all royals are deformed because they marry their cousins. And they allow that. I'm no expert here, and so we're left with Wikipedia for our research, but I did want to make a couple of points. First, look at how many royals have been continuing to marry their cousins. Look at the years at the beginning. 1999, 1993, 1989, 1984. And these are the ones we know about. Do you think these people are just stupid and didn't get the memo that they're not supposed to marry their cousins? And these are the open ruling families. What about the hidden royal banking families like the Rothschilds? That question brought me to this article from Discover Magazine, which I'd like to read to you in part. In Paris, in 1876, a 31 year old banker named Albert took an 18 year old named Bettina as his wife. Both were Rothschilds, and they were cousins. According to conventional notions about inbreeding, their marriage ought to have been a prescription for infertility and enfeeblement. In fact, Albert and Bettina went on to produce seven children, and six of them lived to be adults. Moreover, for generations, the Rothschild family had been inbreeding almost as intensively as European royalty, without apparent ill effect. Despite his own limited gene pool, Albert, for instance, was an outdoorsman and the seventh person ever to climb the Matterhorn. The American DuPonts practiced the same strategy of cousin marriage for a century. Charles Darwin, the grandchild of first cousins, buried a first cousin, and so did Albert Einstein. That's fascinating. In our lore, cousin marriages are unnatural, the province of hillbillies and swamp rats, not Rothschilds and Darwins. In the United States, they are deemed such a threat to mental health that 31 states have outlawed first cousin marriages. This phobia is distinctly American, a heritage of early evolutionists with misguided notions about the upward march of human societies. Their fear was that cousin marriages would cause us to breed our way back to frontier savagery, or worse, you can't bury your first cousin, a character declares in the 1982 play Brighton Beach Memoirs, you get babies with nine heads. So when a team of scientists led by Robin L. Bennett, a genetic counselor at the University of Washington and the president of the National Society of Genetic Counselors, announced that cousin marriages are not significantly riskier than any other marriage, it made the front page of the New York Times. The study, published in the Journal of Genetic Counseling last year, determined that children of first cousins face about a 2 to 3 percent higher risk of birth defects than the population at large. To put it another way, first cousin marriages entail roughly the same increased risk of abnormality that a woman undertakes when she gives birth at 41 rather than at 30. Banning cousin marriages makes as much sense, critics argue, as trying to ban childbearing by older women. Now again, Darwin and Einstein both married their cousins. What? They didn't get that memo? Think about it. The article I just read claimed that there's a 2-3% to higher risk of birth defects with cousin marriage. <laughs> Many of you are probably, whoa, I don't want to do that. But if you understand anything about statistics, a 2-3% to is absolutely not a true correlation and should be ignored entirely because it's meaningless. That's a fact. A 100% increase of birth defects would be worth investigating, but it is still an unlikely connection. A 200 to 300% increase tends to point to a truer connection. Despite all of the junk science stories you hear on a daily basis, a mere 2 to 3% is absolutely nothing statistically, and the true conclusion should be that there is no statistical increase. In other words, if cousin marriages resulted in a three times or 300% increase in birth defects, then there could be a concern for society, something to look into. But you cannot cite a minuscule 0.02 or 0.03 times increase because that is statistically meaningless. I hope you understand that. And if you don't, I suggest you read Junk Science Judo because false statistic manipulation is a horrible plague on society, especially in courtrooms. As a different example, look at the difference of lung cancer between smokers and non-smokers. For males, in this study, it's a jump from 0.2% non-smoker to 15.9% smoker. I think that's 80 times more likely if you smoke. Regardless of my math skills, you are many times 
more likely to get lung cancer if you smoke. Not just a mere 1-2%. to If there was only a cited 1-2% to more chance of getting lung cancer from smoking, the correlation would be statistically nothing, and you'd be free to smoke without any fear of lung cancer because there is no correlation with a mere 1-2% to increase. But getting back to our subject, there is absolutely no physical reason why you can't marry your cousin. And you can't cite that 1-2% to increase in birth defects because that statistic is entirely meaningless for statistical purposes. Don't let statistics fool you into believing in false correlations and subsequent false causation. It really appears that the fear of cousin marriages began around 1846. As I re read this article, ask yourself, was this a spontaneous study or an or orchestrated movement to scare we, the plebeians? In 1846, Massachusetts Governor Briggs appointed a commission to study mentally handicapped people, termed idiots in the state. This study implicated cousin marriage as responsible for idiocy. Within the next two decades, numerous reports, for example, one from the Kentucky Deaf and Dumb Asylum, appeared with similar conclusions, that cousin marriage sometimes resulted in deafness, blindness, and idiocy. Perhaps most important was the report of physician Samuel Bemis for the American Medical Association, which concluded cousin inbreeding does lead to the physical and mental deprivation of the offspring. Despite being contradicted by other studies, like those of George Darwin, who was the child of Charles Darwin, and Alan Huth in England and Robert Newman in New York, the report's conclusions were widely accepted. I wonder why. These developments led to 13 states and territories passing cousin marriage prohibitions by the 1880s. For the Christian, the Bible does not prohibit cousin marriage. Rebecca and Isaac were cousins, Rachel and Lee were cousins of Jacob, and there are others cited. But here's the main point, the main point articulated really well, actually, in this Wikipedia art article. Cousin marriage has often been chosen to keep cultural values intact preserve family wealth, maintain geographic proximity, keep tradition, strengthen family ties, and maintain family structure or a closer relationship between the wife and her in-laws. Fascinating. There's a reason why the elite marry their cousins, and you don't. And it's not because you're smart and they're not. It's because they care about their bloodlines and estates, and they manufactured a false fear to cause you, the peasant, to abhor the idea, and thus willfully dilute your bloodlines. The trickery has worked so far, but maybe it's time to change things. So I say, go ahead and marry your cousin, especially if they're hot. But now here's the hard part. You're going to have to convince him or her that it's perfectly fine. Good luck with that conversation, but just remember to point out the fact that Einstein thought it was smart too. Flatline, there's no superior bloodline. Flatline, flatline, you got me once, but that died. Hey.